Hello and welcome to the SBN Newscast with your hosts Scott and Kendra. We've had a busy week this week as our team prepare for our end of season conferences on Tuesday the 15th next week. On Tuesday we will kick off the day at 1pm working with our partners at Entrepreneurial Scotland, Africa Scotland Business Network, Northern Irish Connections, Global Scott and Global Welsh to deliver a conference focusing on diaspora, networks and entrepreneurship. We have a great lineup of entrepreneurs and global experts joining us from Tokyo, Cape Town, New York and Dublin, who will be discussing the influence of diaspora networks on entrepreneurs both within and out with their home country and how working internationally affects their ambition to start new enterprises. Collectively, as a group, we will also explore how diaspora networks can be better utilised to support the growth ambitions of entrepreneurs. On the same day, we will then host our end of season SBN Global Showcase, which will kick off at 4.30 p.m., this time in partnership with the fantastic team at Kissing with Confidence. We will be taking a practical look at the building of a virtual network, and we will be hearing stories of those who have utilised these networks and virtual platforms to build their global network and what it has meant for their business. For this conference, we will be utilising the platform Remo. So for those joining us, remember to build your profile and register in advance so that your experience is seamless and we look forward to welcome you there. Both of these events will be high energy events that I encourage you to put in your diaries and register via the links attached. And on this occasion, these events will be open to non-members and the wider SBM community who feel that they can gain value from the insights that will be shared at the events. So I look forward to seeing you there and use the links below. Yeah, thanks so much, Kendra. And before we go into our speakers today, let's run down some of the news. Uh, Christine Essen wrote a piece for Daily Business where she discussed the Diaspora Conference next week and how it's a great opportunity to unite Scotland's lost actors. Um, EIE 21 went off to great success yesterday. Uh, Kate Forbes made a keynote speech and SBN were lucky enough to have a booth in the Business Exchange. So thank you for visit visiting us if you did. Um, there was great news for Michael Mancini and his business 1718 Limited as they've experienced their busiest year to date despite the circumstances. Uh, and celebrations are in order as well for Murdo McLeod and Zest Mixology as they celebrate 10 years in business and a decade of decent drinks. Uh, the Power Within are sharing their fully funded award-winning Business Growth Academy where all business owners in Scotland are available to sign up so you should definitely check out that link in the description. Episode 68 of the podcast series went live last week. Fraser Allen interviewed long-standing SBN member Fiona McKinnon, who shared insights into boosting your mental health. Ian Houston then continued his Letter from America series in the Glasgow Herald, as he wrote an impassioned piece about remembering the fallen Scot of Vietnam. Uh, and some other business growth news, eFundamentals, the Edinburgh-based tech firm, continue their expansion as they create 12 skilled tech jobs here in Scotland's capital in order to aid their global expansion. Uh, and there's also some events to look out for. Carbon Financial continue their event series and conversations as they speak to Jamie Murray on June 23rd from 7.30pm. Barr and the team at PB Link kicked off a busy summer of events with the British Polish Construction Forum yesterday and are following it up with a golf and barbecue business networking in Cheswick on June 17th and then a couple of business networking in central London events, starting with a coffee morning on June 18th and a networking on the River Thames on July 7th. So check out the links for all them in the description. And of course, we've got our two conferences next week on June 15th. Uh, at 1pm, we're de delivering the next edition of our Diaspora Conference. This year, focusing how the power of diaspora networks can support entrepreneurs in scaling businesses. Then at 4.30pm, with virtual networking and kissing with confidence, uh, we're going to be learning some of the key skills you need to use when virtually networking, and then learn from those who have been there, done that, and used it to scale their businesses. But that's all from me, Kendra. How about we welcome our first guest? We're delighted to firstly welcome Katie Hester. Hello Hi. Katie, how are you today? Hi. Well, thanks, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you for joining us on the SBN Newscast. Do, do you want to kick off by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit more about the work you do and who you work with? Yeah, definitely. So my name is Katie Rose Hester and I work as a content strategist and producer. So essentially um, a content strategist and writer. 
uh, in here in Edinburgh. And I work full time for a company called X Design, and I consult for an agency called Tabern. I've had the opportunity to work for some really, really cool companies and clients since I moved to Edinburgh about six months ago. Uh, but essentially what I do is help craft content marketing assets or campaigns on behalf of tech companies. So generally that means that I'm writing things like blogs, articles, emails, white papers, social media posts, press releases, really anything that could be considered part of a company's digital footprint, um, I am strategizing and then creating. Amazing. Well, we've worked with you um, on our content strategy at SBN, and I know that some of the insights that you shared with us have been extremely um, valuable and helped us as we position some of our uh, collateral. And I've spoken to you before and prior to becoming a content strategist, you had a career as a lawyer. Um, I was wondering, do you feel that your background as a lawyer has shaped the way that you approach the work you do now in any way? Yes. Um, going to law school and practicing as an attorney for several years, it didn't just, it doesn't just impact the way that I do my job now. It impacts the way that I think about everything. Um, law school really does rinse your brain <laughs> and um, being a lawyer really does just totally shift your perspective. Um, I tell people who, you know, a lot of my clients or my coworkers will ask me the same question that you've just asked me. And I like to talk about how um, something people might not realize is that working as a litigator, and I, I was a litigator, I was a corporate defense attorney, and working as a communication specialist or a content marketer the process is actually very, very similar. So essentially both of these things are user-centered design or user-centered communication. So in both situations, um, a client will walk in your door and they will have some type of position that they want to advance. In law, it's obviously some type of defensible position. They don't want to give up money. They don't want to give up property, something like that. Um, and in communications, it's usually that they have a service or a product that they want to sell. But in either event, you're really talking to people who just want to get their position across in the most persuasive, effective way possible to the correct audience. Um, and, you know, in law, the audience is a jury or a judge or opposing counsel. And obviously in communications and content marketing, you're talking more about consumers of products and services but you really sort of work at the strategy the same way. You do a lot of research into uh, you know, what it is that your client has going on, why they're here in the first place, what led them to your door. You do a lot of research into the people uh, that you are trying to advance their position to. So you know, in content marketing, that's user persona, personas and audience research and things like that. But, the two areas are actually, in terms of process, uh, very, very similar. Um, but I, I also think that just on a larger scale, um, the way that law school and, and working as a lawyer has impacted the way that I think about things is actually really surprising. It continues to surprise me as I do my work um, because people might think that in law school, you actually look at like contracts, but I never saw a contract in law school. The first time I saw a contract was actually like my second day of legal practice. And it was terrifying because I didn't know what one was <laughs> because law school is actually just a giant intellectual exercise about big questions. It's just a lot of why and content marketing is a lot of why content marketing is really more of a deep dive into human behavior than anything else. What could I say to you that would get you to buy this product? Um, and so I think that law school uniquely prepared me for this career in that way, even though I obviously had no idea at the time that I'd be doing this. Amazing. It's amazing hearing you discuss the similarities there. And I suppose like you're saying, it's the, the why that flows through all of it and understanding your client and your audience. And that, yes. like, it's a really good synergy, like hearing you talk about the similarities and how it uh, prepared to you. It's really interesting. And just earlier, when you were telling us a little bit more about yourself, you mentioned that you moved to Scotland um, six months ago. So you, you relocated um, and are now scaling, supporting businesses that are scaling, sharing your expertise. But it can't have been an easy transition when you think of moving here last year. So how's that been for you? 
very hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'd be lying if I said that it was a seamless, smooth transition. Uh, So I actually moved to the UK in March of 2020, the day before lockdown number one. So I got on a plane to leave Chicago on the 27th March, and I landed at London Heathrow with my visa on the 28th, and thousands of workers were furloughed the following Monday. So one thing about um, my visa that I've got is that I wasn't able to look for work until I arrived in the country. And so I arrived in, in the UK in the middle of a global pandemic, um, facing what we all had basically started to understand would become you know, a real economic issue over the next year. Everybody's getting furloughed, people are getting laid off, businesses are closing, and I'm applying to jobs. And it was very, very difficult. Uh, but one thing that I will say that I think completely changed the trajectory of my professional career in the UK is moving to the city of Edinburgh, which I did in December, the day before Christmas, because I love moving at inconvenient times. Um, So I moved here on December 24th of last year. So I've been here about six months and it has made all the difference in the world. I've just found the community to be so, I I was living in England before, and I've, I've really found the community to be just so warm and welcoming here. And what really sort of stands out to me is that when I got here, I basically reached out to people and said, this is what I can do. Uh, please give me a chance to do it. And people were like, okay, which just like blew my mind. People were like, yeah, you seem trustworthy. Your LinkedIn profile looks all right. Like, let's give you a chance. And I'm so thankful to the people that did because... I was able to then get in the door with some really amazing people and show them what I'm capable of. And um, it really feels like the community here is what enabled me to do that and to sort of take the next steps with my career here. So that's been wonderful. Yeah, you've picked your times for making these moves. Um, but it's, it, it must be great for the companies that you're working with now because the insights that you share are ex- extremely valuable, but also you have that insights of different um, markets that you've been in. And I just wanted to ask you obviously, you've highlighted there about your feeling of community when you came to the city of Edinburgh. So was that your perspective before? Was there, were you aiming to come to Scotland or was it just the UK that you were moving to and relocating to at the time? Or was that I, always your plan? I've always loved Edinburgh. I spent two days here in like 2011 and I told myself if I ever had the opportunity again, I would move here and I would try to like make a go of it, get a job, you know, figure out a way to stay here for longer. And in 2016, when I decided to leave legal practice, in the space of a week, I quit my job, sold my house, pocketed the money and got a tourist visa to Edinburgh. And that was obviously five years later, but it had just sort of stuck out in my mind as being a place that I really wanted to return to if I ever was able. And so I did that and it was very much like a quarter life crisis type situation, like just leave everything behind and move. But um, I spent six months here on a tourist visa, just traveling and eating haggis and trying whiskey and just, you know, doing Scottish things and absolutely fell in love with it. And when it came time to move back, I think I always knew that I would end up in this community in Edinburgh, in Scotland. Um, But when you move in the middle of a pandemic, you are sort of beholden to where opportunity is. And um, I was, you know, not sure when I would get to Scotland and I was, you know, looking for opportunities where I was before. I just, because of that six months that I had spent here back in 2017, I had a few connections here and, um, you know, just due to the nature of the pandemic being, it was difficult to make new connections where I was, but since I had a few here, I was able to reach out and sort of get those wheels turning. And then, um, yeah, ended up here in December and it's been really wonderful. Amazing. What a story. And I'm sure there's quite a few um, tips that you could share with um, some of our audience on uh, transitioning, um, because it sounds like you've done quite a few of those uh, movements. But I was going to ask, because you share such valuable um, tips and takeaways on your LinkedIn, I wondered if you had any to share with our audience regarding content strategy today. So, yeah, I 
basically try when I first get in touch with a client or when I'm evaluating a new piece to write about at my full-time position, you know, a new topic or something, what I'm always trying to keep in my mind and convey to the people I work with is that you are the person or the business most uniquely positioned to own your story. Uh, you know your story. I am not here to tell you what that story is. I'm just here to help you actually tell it. So I like to think of myself as sort of a conduit, like a bit of a lightning rod. So my job is really to learn about what it is that you do or make, what it is that you're passionate about and take that information and then help diffuse it to people in the most effective, attractive way possible. So I'm really, my job is really mostly about facilitating connections and coming up with connections that maybe you hadn't considered before or that were less than obvious, but have the potential to engage uh, new customers. So, you know, something like maybe you're selling a product and you haven't thought about the ways that it's similar to products that have been successful in the past. That might be something that I could, you know, talk about and facilitate a conversation about. And that's, that's my value. That's what content strategy uh, is really all about um, on the strategy side. So it's really not about coming into your office and telling you, okay, this is your brand. You know, this is your message. This is this is who you are. You tell me who you are because you know who you are better than anyone in the world. And then I tell you how we're going to let everybody else know who you are. Amazing. Well, that's clearly defined the value that you add. And uh, on behalf of SBN, we can recommend um, getting in touch with you for anybody that's looking at their content strategy just now. We're just looking for some um, insights to speak to Katie and we'll make sure that your details are linked but thank you for um joining us it was a pleasure to have you um, oh, join thank us you so today. much for having me thank you well i'm sure we'll speak to you again soon thank you bye absolutely bye yeah thank you very much to katie and next i would like to welcome our second guest today ian dowson hi there ian good to see you yeah, good to see everybody yeah, thank you very much for joining us. So just to kick off, um, I wanted to open up with our first question. Um, you've been a member of SBN since its inception, which is actually longer than I have. Um, and I've noticed throughout our time that you've um, attended a lot of the London meetings and participated in the majority of our events since going virtual. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how's your SBN experience been? Firstly, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to join the podcast. It's a great privilege to be able to speak to fellow SBN members and friends uh, 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 and give you all the benefit of my experience. Well, at first, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but it seemed a good idea to me that I could help Scottish businesses develop because of the common heritage I have with them. Over the years, the physical and virtual events have developed considerably. I remember one misty November evening walking up the Horsbury Road in London towards Scottish, towards London Scottish House, hearing the swirl of the pipes through the mist, and then getting to the entrance of London Scottish House to see a piper in full Scottish reg regimental dress, very atmospheric and very unique. The networking at SPN is great. The Subjects covered, they're always interesting. The masterclasses by prominent Scottish business people are inspiring. And on top of all of this, I get the opportunity to help Scottish businesses to either enter the London market or expand internationally. Yeah, thank you very much. The masterclasses to me have always been a bit of a standout. Uh, and as uh, and as SBN was started with the idea of, of finding people like yourself to help support Scottish businesses, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your professional background. Well, since leaving Musselburgh many moons ago, I've lived in North London. I became an accountant, doing chief accountant, controller, and FD roles for a number of UK blue chip companies. I then moved away from the finance role towards corporate development, and then having to get uh, uh, my hands really dirty in operational management. And during this career, I spent long periods of time in Belgium and in the USA. 
I now write, consult, and talk on innovation in GovTech, FinTech, corporate development, as well as mentoring a number of startups. So you're definitely keeping yourself busy. Uh, I know I know you also got involved in the startup world of London from 2008. How did that happen? Well, to be honest, when I first got involved, I couldn't really understand what was happening. Every time I went out to a meetup, usually in dark bars in Shoreditch, somebody's <laughs> got to do it, uh, I kept on meeting PhDs. And I thought I knew about startups and innovation as I'd done a lot of work looking for clean tech technology on the west coast of the states. Being confused, I started to study what was happening and it all ended up getting out of control. I wrote a 35,000 word paper in 2012 called How Deep Knowledge Was Regenerating London. The main takeaways were informal networks, high quality motivated human capital with global reach, I was then asked to speak at various events, produced academic papers, and introduced to the new startup domains of FinTech and GovTech. So with your finance background, getting involved in FinTech was very much a fit, but what about GovTech? What, what is that? Yeah. Well, just a point about FinTech, it was very aligned to my background, but it's moved so fast. And I count one of my major professional achievements in speaking to a packed 600 person conference in London, real dedicated blockchain and, and Bitcoin disciples on investment trends. And I managed to get out alive with some of Paul's. Uh, uh, they liked my take. GovTech is using design thinking to redesign government services to be more user centric and outcome focused. Superficially, it's the application of cloud computing architectures that power big tech. That alone saves governments billions, but its real value is developing service design capacity, giving governments the ability to completely redesign services to be more accessible and inclusive, achieving outcomes at a much lower cost. The UK is a world leader in this approach, you may be surprised to hear, uh, through its government digital service. And in Scotland, there's one outstanding example is the CivTech program that develops innovative approaches to local government and government uh, problems. What interests me about GovTech basically is that the problems faced by governments are so large. If you think of CivTech, it takes such a time to turn around. Governments are so much larger than any, any fleet of super tankers, but there are approaches that you can apply that have, that improve outcomes that have real societal impact. Uh, I completely agree with you about CivTech. Obviously, SBM, we talked to a lot of people around the world, and, and CivTech's one thing that I think that surprises people, especially coming out of Scotland. Um, but that's what you've done and what you've been through in the last uh, 10 years. What have you been thinking about at the moment in this time of change? It comes out of some work I did with the clients on working from home. They have problems with getting organised with so many people, so many employees at home under lockdown. And they were finding it difficult to manage new processes and what tools to use. I helped them to establish some common processes and management practices and uh, uh, really start getting the head round about how to manage a distributed workforce. So I forgot about COVID and started to think exactly what was going on here. Everything now is decentralized, IT, supply chains, employees, customers, uh, uh, but management structures in the main have remained linear, centralized, and command and control orientated. Out of this came two concepts, that of computational management and digitally distributed leadership. Computational management repositions management into using complex systems and network ideas 
to optimize firm outcomes. All of this is driven by 24 seven data flows and metrics integrated with predicted analytics. And in the future, this will include artificial intelligence systems. Think very much of the underlying technologies that power ad serving technology or automatic robot warehouses. Because of this change, management will move away from the command and control, telling people what to do, because that becomes automated, and very much more towards getting the best out of people using soft skills, training, facilitation, and support. In digitally distributed leadership, leadership becomes distributed to respond to this change. Core concepts are the team becomes the unit of leadership, not only the unit of delivery, with all teams having access to the same 24 seven metrics as management. They build their own problem solving networks using agreed frameworks and have common communication platforms uh, uh, so that everybody un can understand what everybody's saying. And that's very, very important that if if one group uses a certain uh, uh, number of three-letter acronyms uh, and the other group doesn't, uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, 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 get become uncoordinated uh, happens really, really fast. So with all that change going on, which is often something that big companies and corporates worry about, um... What's, what have you to be optimistic about? What, what is optimistic in all this? Well, I'm very, very, very much optimistic coming out of the chaos of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been tough for a lot of businesses. Global economies face massive changes. Some of them are economic rebuilding and recovery, climate change, decarbonization, and serious questions about economic resilience. And if this isn't enough, there's a backdrop of massive technological change uh, occurring. And I also sense that political and social agendas are also changing. When change on this scale happens, and it only occurs once a generation, there's a massive series of business opportunities opened up. And I think there's a great opportunity here for SBN members and friends to use the SBN global network to leverage how they can benefit from this very turbulent world and the future that awaits us. I couldn't have put that better myself, Ian. Thank you very much for that. If anybody is interested in, in the things Ian talks about, specifically some of the GovTech stories, I, I um, suggest you connect with him on LinkedIn. He's always sharing very interesting insights. Um, the link to that will be in the description of this video. But uh, for now, Ian, I just want to say thank you for your time and thank you very much for joining us. As always, Scott and I extend an invite to those of you who wish to join us on a future SBN newscast. And thanks again to our guests today that joined us, Katie and Ian. Yep, and we hope to see everybody watching at our events next Tuesday on June 15th. You can sign up in the links below. Thanks very much. Bye.